Thank you for coming to the Lego Tactical first uh, video online training session. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get going. First, um, there's no video chat feature in this one. If, if you want to ask a question, you can open a chat window and type in your question. The question will go to Nathan, who is our moderator today, and he will relay the question to me, and then we'll answer it to the group. Um, stay here until the end. Um, at the end today, we're actually going to bring on a special guest who is going to give you some information about where to go and what to do after this online training so that you can continue to build your skills actually in the real world versus learning the safety aspects here in the virtual world. So we're ready to go. And you should be following me on the slideshow that will pop up. This is our Pistol 101 class, which is introductory. It's primarily concerned with safety. Um, it's primarily oriented towards people who aren't familiar with firearms. So it's really basic. And again, if you have questions, don't forget, type the question in and we'll do our best to make sure that you leave with all the information that you feel you need. So always when we're dealing with firearms, our most important concern is firearm safety. A couple of things I wanna talk about here at this point. Um, first and foremost, you're the only one that can prevent your firearm from going off when you don't want it to. A couple of cautionary things that are just routine in, in the people that work with firearms regularly. When you're doing stuff like this, there is no ammunition in the room that you're working in. When you're cleaning firearms or working on your firearm, all of your live ammunition should be in another room. That is just one very important step to not having the gun go off when you don't want it to. So take all the ammunition. If you haven't already, all the live ammunition goes into another room. If you can see the stuff that I have sitting here on the table, that is all either dummy ammunition or components of ammunition. There are no live rounds in the room with us today. Okay? So if you take a minute and do that. So take a minute and move the ammunition out of that room if you haven't already. Go ahead. And we'll continue on here. So uh, there are a couple of underlying causes of why people have accidents with firearms, why the gun goes off when they don't really intend it to. And uh, typically I hear things like, oh, uh, the, they, they do things with the gun or whatever. The, the underlying two causes are ignorance, which is in this case, a lack of knowledge. People um, get a piece of equipment and they bring it home and in many cases it's pretty obvious how it works and what you need to do to use that piece of equipment and safety isn't so much of a concern. But with this piece of equipment now safety becomes a big concern. So you need to learn and practice certain things that make you an operator, a safe operator of this piece of equipment. And the other underlying cause is carelessness. And this is something that happens when people begin to think that they know what they're doing. Carelessness happens when we think we know the rules well enough to start bending them. And we sort of start to cut corners. And it's typically at that point where you're gonna have your first incident and if you're lucky and you followed all the rules that we're gonna talk about, it is not catastrophic. If you haven't followed the rules, that could end up being a catastrophic event. So the, the things that we're gonna go over here are important that you follow and do them every time you handle a firearm. 
So in the firearm safety rule world, there are four universal rules that everybody needs to learn and practice every time you handle a firearm. First and foremost, every gun is a loaded gun until you prove otherwise. Um, I thought it was unloaded. I didn't know it was loaded. I didn't know that, whatever. All of those to me generally are a euphemism for I did something stupid and I don't want to tell you about it. Because the first thing we do when we pick up a firearm is verify that it is unloaded. We're actually going to talk about how to do that in a little bit. Never point a firearm at anything you do not intend to destroy. Um, in the real world, those bullets don't stop until they run out of energy. There's no reset, there's no do-over, and there's no take-backs. Okay. Um, I see that some people just joined us. I do want to reiterate that if you're going to participate with us today, um, please make sure that there is no live ammunition in the room that you're doing this seminar in. All of that can be in another room, and we will be more than happy to give you a few seconds to take your ammunition, any live ammunition, into another room at this point. Okay? Hopefully you'll be able to hear me anyway, because I have a tendency to be a little loud. Number three, keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. This is a training thing. This is a repetition thing. So bear with us. How do I jump where we got it? We're learning to. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Everybody should see art. Every okay. Tell so me. you should see art big right now. I'm big now. Oh, that makes me feel good. <laughs> okay. So when you pick up a firearm, this finger should always go along the side of the frame. It is natural that we want to put that finger on the trigger. That's where it was designed to go. That's where it's supposed to fit. But if anything happens and we unintentionally put pressure on that trigger, the gun could go off. So in, in the real world, this is just a training and repetition thing. Keep practicing that. When the gun gets picked up, we pick it up and the finger goes along the side of the frame. We don't need to put our finger on the trigger until we actually have our sights lined up on a target. And then all we need to do is move that finger from the side of the frame down to the trigger and begin our trigger press. Right, and that's, that applies to any firearm, not just handguns. That is across the board, and it doesn't matter whether you're somebody who is not used to handling firearms, never handled a firearm before, or if you earn your living using your firearm as part of the tools that you, learn, that you use to make your living. Um, that, those rules apply across the board equally to everyone. And number four, always be sure of your target and what is beyond it. Um, this one, particularly if you're out in the real world, uh, we, we tend to get a little bit complacent with this because the places where we go to practice all provide us with nice boundaries and a perfect backstop that's going to stop whatever rounds they allow us to shoot at it. So those rounds are gonna stay contained in that practice area. We don't have to worry about rounds getting out unless we do something really foolish and not following the other rules and something happens and goes horribly wrong. But typically in that practice area, we don't have to worry about where that bullet's gonna end up. In the real world, if you're carrying a firearm as part of your self-defense plan, now, there are concerns about where that bullet is gonna end up. So you do need to be aware of what's going on between you and a potential target and what's on the other side of that potential target, what's going on. There may be times that a shot would be called for and you can't make that shot because of something that's going on either 
between you and the target or, or beyond the target that isn't safe. Some other things to think about. People get shot with unloaded guns all the time. There's that, I thought it was unloaded, I didn't know it was loaded. That doesn't happen in our world, okay? Always, always check the status of the firearm before you do anything else with it. Before handling, remove the feed source and triple check the magazine well, the chamber, and the breech face for live ammunition. And we're gonna do a little bit of an explanation or demo here quick. As you can see, this one is already open. And a second, let me scroll. Okay, there you go. As you can see, this one's already open. The safety, is, the safety device is in, indicating that the chamber is empty. In the real world, you're not gonna have that unless it's been in storage. So when you are working with a pistol that you use on a regular basis, we're going to remove the magazine. There should be no live rounds in the magazine. And then we're going to look down the barrel. And you'll actually be able to see down there. And then underneath this hook is called the extractor. And that hook, every once in a million times, will get a round trapped underneath it. So we're going to look down and in and down the magazine well and verify that all three of those places are empty and that is now an unloaded firearm. That doesn't mean that we do anything different. We still don't point it at people. We still don't point it at ourselves. It is still not a toy. It's just unloaded. And that brings us to not muzzle sweeping or flagging yourself or anyone ever. Um, the two places where this happens most often to ourselves is when we are removing the gun from the holster and replacing it in the holster. So watch your body when you're pulling out of the holster and replacing the firearm in the holster. Those are the two biggest things where we'll flag ourselves. Other than that, you always need to watch where your muzzle is pointed so that the people around you are not getting swept by your muzzle. In the civilian world where we are, there is no reason to ever hand someone a loaded firearm. Unload it, do your three-point check, show it to the person you're handing it to, let them verify that the firearm is unloaded, and then you can hand it off to them and they can do whatever it is they're gonna do, whether they're gonna test fire it, whether they're gonna look over your new toy, whatever it is, um, there's no reason that we hand that gun over to them in a loaded or even with the slide closed condition. If you find a firearm that's unattended or um, for an unknown reason it's been left and this does happen, at the range where I was the head range safety officer, I actually had a person call me one day and say, hey, I just got here to the range and there's an AR-15 sitting in the rifle rack and there's nobody here. So luckily for the owner, we got it back to them. The person who found it was honest. Um, that's a 600 to 800 to 1,000 who, I don't, I don't know the rifle, but that's a really expensive mistake. So first, don't leave your stuff lay around. And second, if you should come across something like that and you don't know how to do it, find somebody who's familiar with that system. If you can, you can verify that it's unloaded and make it safe. If not, just leave it alone. Find somebody who is familiar with that system and have them make sure that the firearm is safe. Some etiquette things. It is always a good idea to ask before playing with somebody else's pistol. Um, some people are very touchy about how their firearms are handled. Um, they don't like certain things done to their firearms. So ask somebody before you just take over or start using somebody else's uh, firearm. It's just a good idea. I've already had people even at gun shows where they're up for public display, if you will, um, tell me that they don't want me to do that with that particular firearm. Okay, fine. 
Again, never ever pointing a firearm at anyone, even when you're just playing around. Um, it, is, it is bad form, it is dangerous, and it's a good way to convince people not to hang out with you. Don't leave your firearm lay around unattended or unsecured. We're gonna talk more about that in a second. And if somebody is gonna offer you uh, the opportunity to shoot their firearm, and I'm a big fan of uh, taking every opportunity to shoot as many different guns and as many different uh, types of firearms as you can, by all means, but always just give it a quick glance, make sure that it's in, it looks like it's in fairly good operating condition and that there's no bore obstructions or anything like that. Sometimes if it's a firearm that's been sitting for a long time, it may have accumulated dust, dirt, spider webs, whatever it is. Just make sure you give it a quick once over before you start playing around with a firearm you're not familiar with. Ask people how the thing works. If you're not familiar with the system that you're working with, ask somebody to explain what's called the manual of arms, what all the buttons and whistles do, so that when you operate the firearm, you can do it safely and efficiently. Art, I'm gonna inject a quick one here. Okay. If everybody can hear me, I'm off camera, but we had one of our own employees, the bore obstruction portion in that last one, we had one of our own employees um, bring a gun here for us to do some work on, and we needed to test fire before we did. And we went downstairs into our test chamber and checked for bore obstructions, which is posted on the wall to always check. And here, he had been at the range all day, shot over 700 rounds, and the last round he fired stuck in the barrel and did not clear out of the barrel. So always check for bore obstructions. I mean, what are the odds of that? I don't know, but it happens. It does happen. And, and the, the I don't, scary or yeah. dangerous part of handling firearms is you don't get one mistake. So you need to be efficient and do these things every time you pick up a gun. It's, it's in your own best interest because if nothing else, and I've seen this happen on the range that I worked at, um, if that handgun or any gun is fired again with that bore obstruction, best case scenario is that there will be a structural failure of the gun. It will ruin the gun. So, and that's best case. That's with nobody getting hurt. So storage and transportation. There's a couple things to think about and, and different situations will call for different measures and we'll talk about them as we come up as they come up. So the general rule is store firearms so that they are not accessible to unauthorized persons. Uh, unauthorized persons typically would, you know, people say to me it would be um, kids. It would be um, people, people who don't live at your house, whatever. Well, my kids growing up, um, actually started shooting when they were really young. And if there had been a situation where somebody wasn't home and they were in, in a dire situation and needed it, I would have considered them authorized. They knew that if they wanted to go shoot recreationally, that all they had to do was say, hey, let's go to the range. And I was more than willing to go to the range. I, it took nothing to convince me to go shoot. So my kids um, shot recreationally and were pretty well versed on how to handle a firearm growing up. My kids' friends, however, were not. Um, there was actually mother of one of my son's friends who carried a little 38 revolver in her purse, but she did not allow her children to play with firearms even play with toy guns. And my question to her was, do you ever remember a year when you didn't find your Christmas presents? So you can't put it somewhere, unless it's in a locked case or box, you can't put it somewhere in your house that your kids aren't gonna find it. So if you have to, take the kids out, take the, take the 
sus or not suspicion, what's the word I'm looking for? Curiosity. Curiosity away from that firearm by letting them see what it will do. Um, there's a couple different demonstrations that you can do to uh, illustrate the power and, and the, the fact that you don't get a do-over again. Milk jug, jug full of water. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of a, a soda can. They're, they're a great demonstration. And make them help you clean it afterward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Takes away the yeah. fun factor. It's, yeah. it's, it's a tool. Yeah, it becomes much more of a tool. Um, it's a good idea to store your firearms in a cool, dry place, and you want to store firearms and ammunition separately. So you do kind of need two cool, dry places. Um, I use my basement. My firearms are all in my safe, and the ammunition is in another small room in my basement. I run a dehumidifier all the time so that it does stay fairly dry in my basement, and it's usually cooler there than it is outside. Um, it's just not a good idea to have them in an unregulated place like an, in, in the attic where the temperature changes drastically or in the basement where it can be uh, damp if it's not dehumidified garage. Uh, garages, again, yep, can be, uh, can get really humid and then dry and humid and that change is what causes surface rust and that can damage your fire. Let's talk about transporting in Pennsylvania. If you're transporting a firearm without your license to carry a firearm, which is the LTCAF, technically in Pennsylvania it's called a license to carry a firearm. And if you don't have that, I recommend that you go and get it as soon as courts open up again, courthouses. They are issued by the county sheriff, who is typically in the county courthouse or the county office of the county that you live in. I read that they did extend those that expired. I saw that if you have an expired concealed carry permit or, or license to carry a firearm, they have extended that date since you can't get into the courthouse to renew it at this point in time. It is extended. Um, I don't remember how long it's extended for, but it will probably be till sometime when you can get in and, and renew it. If you don't have it, it's it's really, it's fairly easy to get it here in Pennsylvania. Um, the applications are online. You can download the application, fill it out, take it to your county sheriff. With, in, in Lancaster County, $20 in cash works much better. They don't take checks or credit cards. Um, and they'll issue it to you on the spot. Not all counties do immediate issuance, but in Lancaster County, they do issue it immediately to you on the spot. If you, if you don't have it and you're transporting in Pennsylvania, um, you are allowed to go to a, a firearms dealer, a place that does work on firearms, a place where you are taking a class with a firearm, or um, a place where you are going to practice with a firearm. And the law says that you can go to and from those places. It does not say that you can carry it with you in the course of your day. And to, in, in the legal aspect, that means you have to put it in the car, go to that place, do what you're going to do, and then take it home and take it out. You can't have it in the car in the course of your regular travel during your errands and other things during the day. Can't even stop for fast food on the way home from a gun shop, technically. Technically not. That's correct. And it must be in a case. The case should be in a portion of the vehicle that is inaccessible to the passengers in the vehicle. And the ammunition must be in a separate container. Okay, so you can't have the ammunition together with the gun. It has to be somewhere if you're, if you're in a vehicle that has a separate um, trunk type thing, it should be in the trunk. If you're in an SUV, that is all one big compartment. It needs to be as far away from the passengers in the vehicle as it possibly can be. So only to and from those places, not anywhere else. If you have your license to carry a firearm, now you are allowed to carry the firearm with you 
on your person or in your vehicle loaded pretty much whenever you're going to somewhere where you're allowed to be. And that's pretty much the limitations on it is um, you can carry it with you wherever you're allowed to have a firearm. It does not give you the right to take it anywhere where you wouldn't normally be able to carry a firearm. Outside of Pennsylvania, when you're traveling outside of Pennsylvania, there is a federal regulation that covers transport, public or private transport of a firearm. That federal regulation states that the firearm must be unloaded in a case. In this instance, the case must be locked and the ammunition must be in a separate container and the case must be in a portion of the vehicle that is inaccessible to the passengers in the vehicle. And that allows passage through any jurisdiction in the United States as long as possession of that firearm is legal in the destination or in the, in the jurisdiction where you started and it is legal for you to possess in the jurisdiction that is the final destination of your trip. So, okay. So now there are some glitches, if you will, in that system. Even though the law says you're allowed to do this, there are some states, um, New York, close proximity, close proximity, where they will not prosecute you for having the firearm, but they will take the firearm from you, and you would have to sue them to get it back. Even if, it's, even if you're doing everything right. Even if you are doing everything else legally, if you are in possession of that firearm, they can take it from you, and they will not prosecute you for, for possession of it, but they will not give you the firearm back. And typically to sue them in order to get the firearm back, uh, you're, you could expect to pay somewhere in the $10,000 neighborhood, so it's actually cheaper just to go buy another gun. Um, in some states, the ammunition is the problem. New Jersey is a no hollow point ammunition state, so every round of hollow point ammunition that you take into New Jersey is a separate felony offense. So if you take your Glock 19, which is probably the single most popular carry gun in the world, and you have 15 rounds in that magazine of hollow point ammunition, that's 15 separate felonies counts that they will charge you with. And this is on record as having happened even to people who accidentally wander into the state of New Jersey. And, and law enforcement officers. And yeah, it doesn't and matter other states. It doesn't matter who you are or what credentials you might carry. Um, there's no exceptions to that law in the state of New Jersey. Uh, the other caution that I will give you at this point about carrying out of state is when you're in those other states, even states that are reciprocal with Pennsylvania, so your carry permit is valid in those states, um, you still have to abide by the rules of the state that you're in, such as in Texas, you are not allowed to carry a firearm into any establishment that serves food. Okay, uh, those kind of things vary by state to state. So if you're planning a trip, go through the state rules. Uh, you can go to Pennsylvania Attorney General's website. There is a link to the various states, particularly the states that we have reciprocity with. And you can link to their Attorney General website and look at what the laws are in the states that you're planning on traveling through. Tell them I'll post it up in the chat. Um, I'll have post in the chat. Nathan will post a link to the Pennsylvania Attorney General's website in the chat as we move on here. So some terms, things that you need to understand about uh, handguns specifically. Couple of things, couple of terms that are going to pop up. And you'll see some of these um, over and over again. So I'm just going to give you a general explanation of some of the terms and how they applied it to possibly different firearms. So you'll have the barrel. A barrel is 
the portion where the bullet travels down and uh, builds up pressure to push it at a really high rate of speed so that it goes to its intended target. There you go. Now you're okay. Right. Try to get <laughs> parts of the barrel. The front end where the bullet comes out is called the muzzle. The back in a semi automatic where the square part, you see this square part here that's attached to the barrel, it's actually part of the barrel. That is the chamber. And that is where, and you'll see this is a dummy round that has no bullet in it, there's no primer in it. That is where the bullet sits waiting to be fired. In a semi automatic pistol, there is one chamber and it is attached to the barrel. The other thing, and this will be really hard for you to see, particularly in, in this situation, down the length of the barrel, there are grooves cut in the barrel that are called the rifling. And that rifling is a little bit narrower than the bullet diameter, so that it actually bites into the bullet and imparts a spin to it, so that as, it, as the bullet flies through the air after it comes out the muzzle, it spins very rapidly and stabilizes it in flight so that it's capable of, tra of uh, going a fairly, very long distance and being very accurate over that distance because of that stability that's added by spinning the bullet. The next term is the action, and the action refers to just the conglomeration of all of the moving parts of the firearm. Whether it's a manually operated firearm or a semi-automatic firearm, all of those moving parts together just are referred to as the action. The cylinder is the portion in a revolver where the extra bullets will sit. Again, the dummy round. They slide in and this rotates around to put each round in turn underneath the hammer so that it can be fired. Typically, a revolver thing, they'll be between four and nine individual chambers in that cylinder, depending on the type of the firearm and the size of the, of the round that you're shooting. Um, actually, I think there's one now that has 12. 22 or There's a, a 22 rim fire cylinder that actually holds 12 rounds now. So the old days of the six shooter are actually kind of gone now. Uh, the bigger guns like the 500 Smith and Wesson, they're typically four or five shots in a cylinder. And the littler guns, the smaller guns, the 22 rim fires can be as many as 12. And then the magazine. The magazine is the device in a semi-automatic pistol that holds your extra rounds. Again, it can be a single stack that holds five, seven, whatever, or a double stack that holds as many as 15, 17. There's actually uh, a standard size magazine that holds 19 rounds in, and up to 21 rounds. So without actually sticking out the bottom of the pistol. I have a little soapbox thing here, and it's that this is a magazine and not a clip. Uh, a clip is a device that's actually used to load magazines. So it doesn't have a spring. And that's the big determination. The big difference between a magazine and a clip is that the magazine has a spring in it so that it feeds the rounds out of it. That's the biggest difference. It just it's one of those things that... Okay, two questions we got here. Okay. One, one from Joe, uh, wants to know if this video will be posted to watch and share with others. That is our plan, yes. Um, we're figuring out how that will work. It's the first time we've done this, so we're, 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 we're walking before we're running, but the intention is to, um, to post this, make this available for others, yes. Uh, second question from Tran was, with a concealed carry permit, I can travel into other states that aren't reciprocal to PA as long as I follow the separation rules of weapon and ammo with exception of New York? Well, I'll let Art take that one and run with that one a little bit. Um, you can transport through 
states that are not reciprocal if you use that federal regulation. Um, and, you, and not all New York, that's New York cop thing. That depends which officer pulls you over in New York to a certain extent. To, to a certain extent. The further yeah. west you go, um, you're probably going to have more likelihood that they may, may, that they, they, they may honor the federal law. Yes. Yes. Um, actually, the, the New York law enforcement officer that I talked to um, said it, it was a New York State police officer, and his, his comment to me was, I don't like having to do that, but that's what they tell me I have to do. Right. So a lot of it is officer-based, uh, not, yeah. notwithstanding the officer's personal feelings about civilians with firearms. Right, yeah, if you're going to a state and you're not sure uh, what their firearms laws are, honestly, pick up the phone and call, call the state police and ask them and say, hey, I'm traveling to your state, I'm going to be vacationing for a week. I'm staying here or whatever. Tell them you're just vacationing yeah. in the state for a week and tell them what you'd like to bring and let them tell you um, if you want to be 100% safe. But even that, everything's up to the interpretation of the officer at the time you're, you're interacting with that officer. It is. Yeah. So it does pay to be nice. <laughs> yeah. So understanding handguns, we'll continue on with that. There are two basic types of handguns that you're going to deal with. First is the revolvers. Um, again, we already mentioned that they can have between, well, in this slide it says four and nine, but we know that there could be potentially more than that now. And then the second is the semi-automatic. And what differentiates the semi-automatic is that typically it has some type of slide and it is operated by the power of the shell itself going off, and that power, some of it goes into uh, making the gun cycle so that it loads itself for the next round. It is also fed from a magazine rather than a cylinder. We're going to talk about the revolvers first. I'll show you a couple of different types and what differentiates them, what makes them different. These are kind of time-based, and they were developed um, as technology developed, and they, they began to be able to uh, produce guns that were capable of firing more than one round. So the, the first firearm that became widely available was the single-action revolver. It was called single-action because the trigger only performs one function and that is to release the cocked hammer. So the, the hammer itself needs to be manually cocked for each shot, and then once you cock the hammer, you can pull the trigger and it will fire the round. When you re-cock the hammer, it rotates the cylinder, brings the next round up, and is ready to fire again. The second one that came along was the double action revolver, and Obviously, now the trigger can perform two functions. So you can now revolve the cylinder and cock the hammer by pulling the trigger. It's a long, hard trigger pull to get all of that to happen. Most all double action revolvers are capable of being fired in single action. So you can choose to manually cock the hammer. And what happens in that case is uh, all of the, the rotation and spring tension is taken up by that manual, the action of manually cocking the hammer. So you'll see that the trigger will move. Well, you would see if we could demonstrate that. The trigger will move, and you now have a much shorter, much lighter trigger pull than you would have when you're firing the pistol, you know, the revolver in double action. Typically, double action is used when you need to fire quickly and single action is used when you need to be really accurate. And then we have probably today the most common of all, and that's the semi-auto pistol. Fires one round each time you pull the trigger, and the energy from that fired round works the slide and reloads the pistol until the magazine is empty, so that each time you pull the trigger, you can fire one round until the magazine is empty and then you need to reload by putting in a fresh magazine. There's a little graphic here that demonstrates 
that firing sequence. Okay, you'll see how as the hammer hits the firing pin, it causes the spent round to be ejected. And then it picks up the next round and reloads it into the chamber. And it will do that. Um, I'm still looking for that self reloading magazine that is used there in that demonstration. I haven't found one yet. But basically, it will do that until the magazine becomes empty. So ammunition. We've talked a lot about ammunition. We haven't talked specifically about it yet. A complete cartridge or round is made up of four components. There's a shell casing. Back here up which is the part that we typically refer to as the brass. It can actually be made of brass or aluminum or steel in some cases. It's just a holding device to keep all of the other components together. A primer, which is the little tiny thing that will be in the center of the case, which we can't even see, which you probably can't see. If you put them on the table, you might be able to see them. Yep, you might be able to see that. There are actually two types of priming systems. This is what's called a center fire primer because it is located in the center of the case. It is replaceable, which gives us the capacity to reload if we choose to. The other type is the rim fire. And that is actually a priming compound that's deposited around the rim of those types of cases. There's no primer in the center of it. Typically, because these cases are so small, they don't have room for a primer in the center, so they use the rim fire system. Uh, the rim fire system is generally a little less reliable because when it's inserted, it's inserted as a liquid, and then they spin it in a centrifuge and allow it to dry. If it isn't evenly distributed throughout the rim when they spin it, it can actually give you a dead spot in the primer. And then um, when you hit that spot, it won't go off. Then there's some amount of powder. And that's governed, again, by the size of the cartridge case that we're working with. Um, tiny little cartridge isn't going to have much powder in it. Bigger cartridge, more powder. And then the bullet. And the bullet is actually the portion that flies down range. So when you ask for a box of bullets, and the person at the store hands you a 100 round box of those, they have technically complied with your request. What you are actually seeking is a round or a cartridge. So if you get a box of nine millimeter bullets for Christmas and that's all there is, your wife did the right thing. So how does all that work? So the round is sitting in the chamber, whether it's in a revolver or a semi-automatic, it's sitting in the chamber. You pull the trigger, the trigger initiates the firing device, whether it's a, a hammer or a plunger, however that particular round is detonated. It strikes that, and the primer is actually made up of a compound that is pressure sensitive. So when the pressure is applied to that compound, it generates a spark. That spark flies through the hole in the case into the powder or comes out of the rim and ignites the powder that's in the cartridge. That powder actually burns at a very high rate of speed. It doesn't explode, it's not that fast, but it does burn at a high rate of speed. If you remember your high school science class, when you turn a solid into a gas, it increases the pressure because now you have a lot more uh, expansion inside of a controlled, a, a same size area. That drives the pressure up. 
As that pressure reaches a critical point, it will push the bullet out of the case, into the barrel, through the rifling, and out the muzzle. What you actually are hearing then is the sound of that high speed gas hitting the atmosphere and the sound of the bullet going through air. Sound barrier. And, and if it's a very high speed round and it breaks the sound barrier, you will also have that. So that's the sound that you hear. The, the longer the barrel, that's why, the longer the barrel, the less noise the firearm appears to make because more combustion has taken place. There's less uh, combustion and gas hitting the air at that high speed. So next, what could go wrong with that? There's actually a few things that can happen during that firing sequence that interrupts or causes something to happen that turns out to be bad for us as the shooter. First is called a hang fire. And this is where you're shooting along and you pull the trigger and you get click instead of bang. So when you pull the trigger and you get click, what you want to do is nothing. Stand there in that firing position and count to 30. Uh, the longest one I have personally ever witnessed was about seven seconds. So from the time um, the person who I was with, it didn't happen to me, it would happen to a person I was shooting with. Um, we were shooting some very old ammunition and by very old, I mean even older than I am. It was actually uh, ammunition that was manufactured during World War II. So <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was <laughs> solid ammunition, but it was, it was manufactured during World War II and um, had, had not been really properly stored and was getting pretty inconsistent. And uh, several of those rounds, the delay was about seven seconds from the time the trigger was pulled until the, the round actually came out of the barrel. So seven seconds from the time click happened until bang happened. So if we start counting, if we get click and no bang, start counting, count to 30. If nothing happens by the time you get to 30, then it has become what we call a misfire. Hang fire is a delay. A misfire is what's commonly referred to as a dud. It's not going to go off at that point. So then you can just work your action, whatever. If it's, a, if it's in a revolver, you move on to the next round in the cylinder. If it's a semi-auto, you have to cycle the action by hand, take that round out and then move on with firing. It doesn't hurt anything. It just, um, you can't assume when you get click that there is gonna be no bang. So click starts the count, count to 30. If nothing happens by the time you get to 30, then you can just cycle that round out and move on to the next round. That's your misfire. Basically you clear and proceed. No harm, no foul. The third thing that can potentially go wrong is called a squib load. That's this is probably, yeah, this is probably the most dangerous thing that can happen, particularly for new shooters, because you're not as familiar with how it sounds and how it feels. So what you're looking for is something different. If you're shooting along, bang, 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 pop. It'll feel less recoil and it will sound different. If that happens and you're not sure, you need to stop and check because the potential is if that round was underpowered enough, there is still a bullet stuck in that barrel. If you fire that next round with that bullet or that obstruction in the barrel, the pressure buildup can happen, can build up to the point where it can cause a, a catastrophic failure of the firearm. So, what do we want to do about that? Obviously, you don't want to look down the barrel. You want to find something that you can drop in there that will tell you whether or not there is a... Is there a pencil laying up there? Pencils work better because it goes forward. Pen has a clip on it. There we go. 
So something that will go the whole way down. And what you're looking for typically in a firearm that is together, you're gonna drop it in the barrel. And if there is no obstruction, you will be able to see it with the slide locked open. Okay? And that tells you that the barrel is unobstructed and that you can continue firing. If doesn't go the whole way through, okay, you're hitting some object, you know there's something in there and it won't push out easily. For that, you can take a rod of some type, softer than the barrel that you're working with, so not steel. An aluminum or wooden dowel rod works really well. I have seen people do it with a cleaning rod, but it typically will mushroom the end of the cleaning rod and ruin the cleaning rod. Or just bring it into us. Or you can, yeah, or you can bring it into the shop and, and Brian will be more than happy to tap it out for you. Um, but if you have that dowel rod and a little hammer, you can tap them out. And again, it will be no harm, no foul, but you do have to make sure that the bore is unobstructed before you fire your next round. So next thing we're going to talk about is how do you make sure you have the right ammunition for your firearm? There are three places that need to match in order for you to be sure that you're putting the right ammunition in your firearm. The first place is going to be the cartridge box. So you're going to buy a box of ammunition. It's going to have something on the end of it that tells you the ammunition that's in that box. The second place will be on the base of the cartridge case itself. It will be marked on commercial ammunition. It will always tell you what that is on the base of the case. If it's not marked, it could potentially be military ammunition. Uh, if you're not sure that it's the right ammunition, then don't shoot that ammunition in your pistol. Okay. Talk to somebody who knows. Find more. somebody who knows more about that stuff. Right. Bring it into the shop. We can identify it for you. But if you're not positive, then don't shoot that. Because particularly, and this is just a demonstration with nine millimeters, those two cases are not the same. And I hope you can see that difference. It is a one millimeter difference in case length, okay? That one millimeter is a critical dimension in a semi-automatic pistol. So if you're not sure, then make sure somebody can positively identify it. And the problem is this shorter case will fire in a typical nine millimeter pistol. This is actually what's called nine millimeter Makarov. It's a, a shorter case from a Russian pistol. It will chamber in a nine millimeter, what we typically refer to as a nine millimeter pistol, and it will fire and it will do some really strange things and actually has the potential to break your pistol because there's space in there that fills up with that expanding gas that we were talking about earlier, and it's not supposed to. Yeah. So, well, and the other thing to be aware of, most of our new buyers are buying nine millimeter guns. Yes. That can be marked nine millimeter, nine mm Luger. It can be marked nine X 19. Nine by 19? Is the same as nine millimeter there, Luger. There are actually four terms that are identical. The first one, is nine millimeter Luger. That is actually a fairly common designation or nomenclature on the boxes. And you'll see that this box is actually marked nine millimeter Luger. The technical correct name of the cartridge is nine millimeter Parabellum. The cartridge was developed in 1903. And the first firearm that was chambered to fire it was the 1906 Luger. That's how it got that designation, nine millimeter Luger. That's technically the round, the gun that it was designed to fire in. The other designation that you will often see 
is 9 by 19. 9x19. That is the same. That means that it's a 9 millimeter bullet and the case length is 19 millimeters long. That's the same as 9 millimeter Parabellum or 9 millimeter Luger. The other one that is becoming popular today is 9 millimeter NATO. 9 millimeter NATO, again, because it is now the NATO standard cartridge, you will see um, boxes marked 9 millimeter NATO. Same thing, it is a 9 millimeter by 19 millimeter cartridge. Um, the, the specifications from NATO actually state that it can have a bullet weight anywhere between 115 and 125 grains. So it is typically the nine millimeter that we shoot the most is 115 or 124 grain or the two most common nine millimeter rounds. Either of those could be in a box marked nine millimeter NATO and be within the specifications. And, and real quick point of note, ammunition. Ammunition, just like everything else in our world, is measured either in millimeters or inches. Mm -hmm. So you have 45 caliber, which is actually 0.45 of an inch. You have 40 caliber, which is 0 0.40 of an inch. And then you have nine millimeter, which is millimeter version of, it's just measuring the diameter of the bullet and the length of the case. We're actually gonna talk about that here today. <laughs> and then the other place, um, that you will find that designation is on the pistol, typically with new pistols, and by new I mean, um, when did the Glocks come out? 1983, 82, yeah. 83. So 80s. They started to mark the caliber on the barrel itself because Glock instituted a thing as they developed new pistols that you could actually interchange barrels and have a pistol of the same, of, of a different caliber on the same frame. In, in the times before that, it was usually marked somewhere on commercial pistols on the slide or on the frame, what the caliber was supposed to be for that pistol. So now they're typically marked on the barrel somewhere. I know you guys can't see this, but it's actually stamped into the top of the barrel because this barrel can be changed out for another barrel of a different caliber and still function but in, in the pistol, but still needs to be fed the correct ammunition. So those three things, the cartridge box, the cartridge case itself, and the barrel or the pistol that you're shooting it in should all match. Cartridge names and terms. Typically, European developed cartridges are named by their caliber and their case length, nine millimeter by 19, okay? Um, US cartridges tend to be named by marketing people, 38 special. There is nothing 38 on the cartridge and there's nothing special about it, but that was the name that the cartridge was given when it was developed in the early 1920s. The 357 Magnum, they are somewhat interchangeable because in a revolver, this critical length that we were talking about with the semi-automatics, the 1819 dimension, is actually fixed by the rim of the case. So it actually, locates the case by this little rim right here that I hope you can see. So the actual length of the case doesn't really matter. So if you buy a revolver that's 357 Magnum, you can shoot 38 specials in it because the actual diameter is 0.357 for both of those cartridges. So in the US, um, cartridges have names, in the European world, they have designations, which, and they're more technical in the European world than they are in the American world. And point, um, point 0.357 for 38 special and 357 Magnum also happens to be the dimension of nine millimeter. 355, okay. yeah, they're really close. You, they are interchangeable. They are somewhat, you can, 
uh, Ruger for a while made a revolver that had a nine millimeter cylinder that you could fire nine millimeter, 38 special and 357. All you had to do was change the cylinders. Yeah. So there, there is some interchangeability in that way. Um, again, revolvers have more interchangeability than semi-automatics because of that dimension of the case. Um, 44 Magnums, a 44 Magnum revolver, you can shoot 44 specials. A 454 Casul, which is a really big revolver caliber, you can shoot 44 Magnums and 44 specials in that. Most manufacturers recommend that you don't do that a lot, not because of the power of the cartridge, because it's actually a less powerful cartridge, but you can build up a ring inside the cylinder that will um, leave a mark that can cause the longer cartridge then not to be able to be slid into the cylinder. So it is okay to do a little bit, but not a whole lot of it. Uh, the next thing that we wanna talk about is plus P and plus P plus. So this actually was something that came about because of that 38 special 357 development back in the 1920s. Uh, even back in the 1920s, attorneys had a pretty big say into what happened, particularly in police departments. And the typical police cartridge was 38 special for the longest time. 357 Magnum came along and actually had the, the capability of breaking an engine block. So when police officers found that they could stop a car with their 357 Magnum revolver, they actually all wanted it. But the attorney said, probably not. So they went back to 38 Specials. They went to the ammunition companies and said, hey, can you make this 38 Special a little more powerful? And the ammunition companies, being civilly, civically minded, did what they could to accommodate them. And you developed the plus P, or plus pressure, or plus power cartridge. So it is a similar dimension cartridge. It will be the same size as the other cartridge that isn't plus P except it will have more powder in it to generate more power. So plus P. And in our world, if a little more is good, a lot more must be better. So they asked for even more and the plus P plus was born. Typically for real, plus P cartridges are not hard to come by in the commercial market. Plus P plus cartridges are pretty hard to find. They're typically only um, law enforcement, even military, doesn't use plus P plus very often. Oftentimes, military cartridges are actually loaded to what commercial standards consider plus P. So some military, that's why some military ammunition seems to be hotter than the ammunition that we shoot commercially, because it is a little bit hotter. Not, not a whole lot, most of it just so makes the plus P plus or plus P standard. So I'm sure that's all clear as mud now. If you guys have questions, type your questions up. We'll try and do our best to, to clear it up for you if we can. Yep, and we will have some time for questions at the end as well. So we're gonna move on. We're gonna talk a little bit about what it takes to get ready to take your pistol to the range for the first time. So first thing we need to do is get the pistol into our hand and get ready to shoot. Grip. We're gonna drop the pistol into our hand. We want it to line up pretty much with the bones in our arm so that the recoil force goes into our body and not into our or, or just into our hand. Again, trigger finger goes along the side of the frame. Our thumb, we're gonna lift out of the way. And all of this space on this side of the gun, we're gonna cover with the palm, with the base of the palm of our hand. So that is gonna cover all of that space. We're actually gonna grip here a little bit by pressing here, and we're gonna press here, so that we're actually creating a solid one-piece unit 
that holds the firearm. The idea being that when the gun recoils, it recoils as a unit. It's gonna flip a little bit. There's nothing we can do about that. And it should push our whole body. So that good solid grip, if you start to shoot and that grip comes apart, you're not gripping tight enough. That should recoil as a single unit. Show them the thumb and the index finger. Spin, yep. spin, spin the other side. Thumbs actually shouldn't touch the gun. They're going to. You don't want to put any pressure. You want to have all the pressure down here and down here. Wrap your fingers so that they're comfortable. Thumbs just lay here. If my joke always is, if I could take my thumbs off and put them in my pocket, I would, but my orthopedic surgeon says that's going to be a problem later. So finger along the side, thumbs just laying along the side of the gun. Do you kind of have to watch a little bit where this thumb lays because you'll see on, if you can see it on this one, the, what would be the slide release is right here and that's the size of my hands, I often will end up touching that slide release. And what that causes is the slide not to stay open after the last shot because the magazine spring can't push it up because my thumb is there. That can be controlled by the add-ons that you're gonna put on the grip um, that come with the pistol when you buy it. Uh, many different ones now come with add-ons that you can put on here to control where your grip lands on the gun. The next thing will be stance, how you're going to stand. And typically, just stand comfortably, feet shoulder width apart, shoulders square with your feet, okay? There was all kinds of, for, for the longest time, there was several different stances that involve turning your feet and turning your toes. Um, we don't need to be that fancy anymore. One of the other things that using that centered stance does is puts the pistol right in front of your face. So you don't really have to worry much about dominant eye anymore because now you're going to be extending the pistol directly in front of your face and it doesn't really take any more or any less effort to go to your right eye or to your left eye if you're not shooting with both eyes open. As a beginning shooter, it actually pays you to learn to shoot with both eyes open. Um, old dogs like me who have been doing this for 50 or so years, my brain doesn't want to learn to do that, so I still shoot with one eye open. But uh, if you're just learning to shoot, it is definitely in your interest to learn to shoot, particularly a handgun, with both eyes open and your brain will learn to superimpose those two images correctly, and then you don't even have to worry about dominant eye at all. Breath control. So breathing causes movement. As you breathe in and breathe out, it causes movement in your body. That movement causes the pistol to move. So again, at some point, in your inspiration or exhalation cycle. So somewhere about halfway when you're taking a breath in or leaving it out, stop breathing. And just hold that breath at a comfortable place for a few seconds. And then we're gonna start to aim. Aiming is a two-step process. The first step is aligning the sights. You'll have a front sight, and a rear sight. In this slide, the front sight is the gray portion and the rear sight is the black portion. Perfect sight alignment is an equal amount of space on both sides of the front sight and the front sight should be even with the top of the rear sight. That is perfect sight alignment. Very easy to say that. It's not as easy to accomplish it and hold it there. So that's sight alignment. Then we're going to take those aligned sights and we're going to create a sight picture using those aligned sights and our target. So 
In this slide, you'll see there's a rear sight, a front sight, and a white dot for a target. One of the things you'll notice is that the front sight is sharp and clear. The rear sight and the target are both fuzzy. That's because your eye can only focus on one distance at a time. Your focus needs to be on your front sight. In order to be your most accurate, the front sight should be sharp and clear, and the rear sight will become fuzzy, and the target will become fuzzy. That's okay. You want to be able to control where that front sight is. That is the critical portion of aiming a handgun. Once you have sights aligned and a correct sight picture, now you can move your finger to the trigger while disturbing your sight picture a minimum amount, and then you begin your trigger press. That trigger press should be slow and steady and just press straight through until the gun finally goes off. It should actually surprise you when it goes off. You do not want to anticipate the gun going off. And then you follow through. And that is the concept of doing the same thing that you've been doing the whole time that the gun goes off. So in a perfect world, I would move my finger to the trigger, I would press the trigger, the gun would go off, and nothing would happen. That doesn't happen because of a thing called recoil. So when I press the trigger, the gun goes off, it should recoil, and when I come back, I'm going to come back front sight, rear sight, and target again. Okay? One of the things that I consistently see people attempt to do is to fight the recoil when the gun goes off by pushing down. And you can't do that. Your timing isn't good enough. So just pull the trigger, squeeze the trigger till it goes off. The, the closest uh, I've heard description of it is like you're trying to drop one drop of liquid out of a medicine dropper, is what you're trying to do. Just squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. The gun will go off, recoil reset, and if you can do it, keep the, trigger keep the trigger to the rear. When you drop back into position, find your front sight in the rear sight on the target, and then allow the trigger to come front and reset, and then begin your next trigger press without ever breaking contact with the trigger. That gives you the most consistency for everything that you're gonna do and allows you to be the most accurate that you will probably be able to accomplish. And when you're getting ready to go to the range, some of the things that you're gonna wanna look at taking along with you, um, actually I don't have all that stuff here. Every place that you go to shoot now will require that you have eye and ear protection. Um, it should be uh, ANSI Z71, I believe is the current standard level safety glasses or higher, well, or something akin to that. If you wear corrective lenses and your lenses that are in your glasses are shatterproofed, they don't necessarily have to be safety glass lenses, but if they're shatterproof, then that will probably be adequate for most places that I've ever been. Um, ear protection, if you're shooting on an outdoor range, one set of ear protection, either muffs or plugs will probably be adequate. But if you're gonna shoot on an indoor range, it is not unusual for people to wear both ear plugs and then put muffs over them because many indoor ranges, particularly the indoor ranges today that allow um, larger size firearms, rifles, and shotguns to be shot indoors, that's a lot of noise. And particularly as a new shooter, it can cause you to flinch. So wearing double ear protection 
is actually a good idea. It will help you control the potential for a flinch. Some of the other stuff to think about, depending on the range that you're going to, you may have to take your own targets. Um, our, the club that I belong to on our outdoor range, you do have to provide your own paper or cardboard targets. So that's something that will um, be dependent on the place that you go. If you're shooting at an indoor range that has a shop attached, they will be more than happy to provide targets for you for the fee. Um, some places, that stuff is included in the fee when you pay to play at their place of business. Uh, it's also a good idea to bring some type of kit with you that you can do some work if you have to. Some type of lubrication. I always carry some type of lubrication with me um, just because one of the most common reasons why particularly semi-automatic firearms malfunction is because they're not proper, properly lubricated. Okay. So carrying something that you can add lubrication with uh, to your firearm is a good idea. Some tools. I talked earlier about cleaning rods and dowel rods and such. I carry a little hammer and an array of cleaning rods of different calibers so that if I have to um, deal with some type of problem, I can. Uh, where's my screwdriver? I also can, I don't know where it is. It's in there somewhere. A, a little screwdriver with multiple bits so that if I have to tighten stuff up or loosen stuff or make changes to a site or something like that, I have uh, a tool that will do that. A couple of and, and a lot of this depends on the firearm that you're using. If you're shooting a, a pistol that doesn't have adjustable sights, you don't need to worry about moving the sights. Um, and this will evolve over time too. You'll get it, your range will, bag. Your range yeah. bag evolves yeah. as your guns evolve. Yep. Yeah. And um, now, when I go to the range, if I'm taking a carbine and I have a scope on it, I'm going to take something to adjust that. Same thing, if I take my 22 revolver, I'm gonna take that, that has an adjustable sight, so I need a little tiny screwdriver to be able to adjust the sights. Those kind of things are dependent on the firearm that you're taking. So some tools to do whatever you might need to do with the firearm that you're working with at the time. I'm running out of stuff to say. Jared's here. Oh, he is? Yep. Okay. So he'll be ready. Right so, after the range? After the range, we are going to have to do some cleaning. For cleaning, there's a couple steps. You need to follow these steps. This information that typically in a in a personal person class, I will help you take your firearm apart and put it back together so that I at least um, get everybody to take it apart and put it back together once. It's more difficult to do that in this venue. So what I'll tell you is all the information that you need to disassemble or field strip your firearm is in your owner's manual. Guys, just because we don't like to read those books doesn't mean you shouldn't read it. There's a ton of good information in that book. Um, and typically, if you're like me, getting them apart isn't the problem. It's getting them to back, back together and not having parts left over because this is a critical thing. Leftover parts in this endeavor are a bad thing. So in your, in your manual for your firearm are the directions that you need to take it apart and put it back together. There is also a ton of good videos online. Um, don't just look at one because not all of them are that great but some of them are really good and some of them will give you a step-by-step -step disassembly and reassembly of your particular firearm. If you bought a firearm that did not come with an owner's manual, if it's a currently manufactured gun, email the manufacturer of the firearm, they will be more than happy to send you all of that information free of charge because it's a safety issue. If 
you have a firearm that is no longer currently in manufacture. Again, on the internet, there is a ton of information that you can use to find out what you need to know about that particular firearm. If the company still exists, they'll most likely send it to you. Yep, they will send it to you for nothing because it is a safety issue. We already talked about the tools that you might need, chemicals that you potentially will need. There are a couple of families. There are things that are what's called cleaner lubricant protectant, CLPs. Some of them, like the Break Free, are um, well known and have been around for a long time. Some of them, which is what a lot of the guys here at the store use now, is, is the Seal One products, um, do a really good job. The reason I'm going with the Seal One now is because it actually even stays on the gun after the gun's been heated up. If you're doing drills and you're doing sequences that heat the gun up, Sometimes the, the lubricant that you have will burn off the gun. This stuff actually hangs around really well. The older stuff that is still available are the Hoppies families and the other stuff like that, uh, REM oils and REM cleans. That stuff is really good too. My recommendation with that is if you're going to use a family, a cleaner and a lubricant, stick with that family. I actually talked to a gunsmith who was brought a gun, the person had used one family's cleaner and another family's lubricant. And when those two get together, they weren't chemically compatible and they actually made shellac that was that hard that he couldn't cycle the gun anymore. So if you're using one brand, stick with that brand. That way you know that they're not gonna be chemically incompatible. And the next thing, the last thing that we're gonna talk about here is hygiene. Um, the chemicals that we're dealing with in the firearm itself, in the ammunition, and the chemicals that we're using to clean and maintain the firearms, these chemicals are actually designed to dissolve the residue from firing that gun. So some of this stuff is pretty strong. We do not wanna get that stuff into our body. So when you're done or during, don't eat, drink, smoke, pick your nose, rub your eyes, any of that kind of stuff, because that can transfer those chemicals from your skin into your body. Kind of like the COVID-19. A little bit like the COVID-19, <laughs> which is why we're here in the first place. <laughs> um, so wash your hands when you're done shooting and when you're done cleaning, lubricating, all of that kind of stuff, go ahead and wash. One of the things I will tell you, other different than what your mother always told you, in this case, you actually wanna wash your hands in cold water because cold water keeps your pores closed and some of these chemicals are transdermal or can go through your skin. So if you wash in cold water, the pores stay smaller in your skin and you don't absorb as much of it. So unlike what your mother told you, Wash your hands in cold water. Even for COVID? Uh, no, we're talking about lead here. <laughs> now, this is not a medical briefing. This is a gun cleaning briefing. So, do you guys have any questions well, out there? Is there something we, popping up? Well, um, do we want to go to the um, to introduce our guest, and then we can ask questions that will cover both what you did okay. and we what he's going to do. So, go ahead up. Go ahead. You can do that. Give me a second here. Grab a chair. You can pull up right here next to me. So I mentioned earlier that we're going to have a special guest this afternoon. Our special guest is Jared Ross from Lodestone Training and Consulting. And he is here to talk with us about the next step. Because as much as we can give you online in this venue that we're in right now, this is a physical activity, and it takes physical practice in order to get to your best possible level. And that is what Jared does. Thank you. Yes. My name's Jared Ross. I run Lodestone Training and Consulting. Just to give you a little bit of background about me and about the company, I, after 9-11, I decided it was my moral obligation as a citizen to enlist, so I did. Went into 82nd Airborne, 
spent some time with them, then spent some time with Fifth Special Forces Group. And it was there that I really learned how to shoot and got a really good appreciation for, for teaching and training. I left active duty and immediately joined 20th Group, which is a National Guard Green Beret unit. I'm still with them and active with them. While I was in the military service, we had a, an attempted break-in at my home, and I wasn't there. I was at Fort Bragg doing PT. So it was my wife who had to defend the house and the kids with a Mossberg shotgun as these guys were trying to break in. So really because of this experience, I really was motivated to teach and train. So like Art said, Lodestone Training Consulting, my company, we're all about getting you on the range and you guys taking the next step. A lot of the classes and the way that we teach is patterned after a special forces school, school that's called Cephalic. That's the Special Forces Advanced Urban Combat School. It's where we teach Green Berets how to shoot. So our beginning classes are all patterned after this. This doesn't mean that we're going to be yelling or I'm going to be hollering at you. It's nothing at all like that. What we do is we take how we teach Green Berets and we break it down, and that's how I teach you. Because I want you to learn how to best handle your firearm and be empowered. So if and when that moment arises like it did with my wife, you will be, be, you will be able to take that firearm and, if necessary, defend yourself and to defend those that you love. That's really what it's all about. Uh, our company... I put a link on the, up for everybody. Thank you. Our company, we have a wide range of classes that start from the most basic, from which I know Art's been talking to you about, about you know, which end does the bullet come out of? And then from there, taking it to, uh, to the next level and then the level beyond that, where we do concealed carry classes, where we do marksmanship classes, where we do what we call combat marksmanship, where now that you've learned how to, to get rounds on a piece of paper where you want to, now we up the ante a little bit and teach you how to move or how to seek cover and, and use barricades, whether it's your couch or your car or whatever, to, to help you out as you are, are facing those problems. Again, we're really all about empowering you and, and helping you to better understand your firearm and help give you the ability to defend yourself if and when that, that moment comes up. And then also we do a, a wide variety of seminars and workshops on all sorts of different topics, land navigation, comfort reading, food storage, mindset, having a good survival mindset, um, radio work, all, all sorts of things that, that we do and that we get into. And we're really good friends with, with Art, with Nathan, with Lanco Tactical. And we, we do a lot with them. So that's why I'm here is to, to help you and to uh, help empower you. Okay, great. Thank you, Jared. Um, we do have a, one question that came up here. Um, gentleman wants to know, um, this would be an art question, um, points of contact for lubrication on a firearm. Um, if you can just briefly cover that, I guess we can cover it in a semi-automatic manner. Um, not necessarily for revolvers, but for semi-autos. Um, I'll tilt the camera down here a little bit so you can maybe show. Basically, it's where the slide contacts the pistol frame. Typically, correct? lubrication goes wherever metal touches metal. The idea of the lubrication is to reduce the friction between the metal parts. So whenever metal touches metal, you're going to want lubrication in there to reduce the friction, reduce the wear on the pistol. Again, Look at your owner's manual. It will tell you where they want you to put the lubrication. And more importantly, it'll tell you where they don't want you to put lubrication. So a little bit all over the gun to preserve the finish on the outside. That doesn't hurt anything, but there are spots inside on some handguns where they don't want you to put lubrication because it will interfere with the function. So metal on metal contact gets lubricated. Be careful of the spots that don't need to be lubricated. Yep. Anybody else? Any other questions at all? If not, we're going to wrap up here in one minute. Um, thank you for participating in our first ever go around and uh, being patient with us <laughs> as we learned this new technology and this new brave new world. If you guys have feedback yes. on improving our presentation to you, Please email or contact the store. If, if not, you know, afterwards, feel free to contact us with any potential improvements that you come up with. We're new at this. We're learning as we go. We appreciate your feedback. Yep. Yep. So if there is no other questions, um, I'm not seeing any here right now. We appreciate you guys being here and being a part of this inaugural run. 
Uh, I did just put up our email address there, sales at lancotactical.com. There's a link to Lodestone Training, so you can go on there and get more information. And uh, thank you. Thank you for being here and being interested. Uh, we do intend to make this video um, available on, if we can host it on YouTube, we'll put it on YouTube, but we'll try to get it up there and uh, make it available so you can share with your friends and family and other people that need this information. So thanks again for participating and you folks have a good rest of your weekend. Be safe. Thank you.